This is Thermopylae on the coast of mainland Greece. In August 480 BC, a Greek army of only 7,000 men, led by King Leonidas and 300 Spartans, fought here against a quarter of a million strong invasion force, led by Xerxes, the king of Persia. At stake, the survival of Greek civilization. Now, with new computer graphics technology, you're about to see this great battle as never before. The vast numbers of soldiers, the troop formations, how they fought, and how the battle was won. Two and a half thousand years ago, Greece was not a unified nation. It was a collection of independent city-states like Athens, Corinth and Sparta, each with their own laws and systems of government. The Greeks lived under the shadow of the mighty Persian Empire, which stretched from present-day countries like Turkey, through northern Egypt, Israel, Iran and Iraq, to Afghanistan and northern India. Two-thirds of the known world. But even this was not enough for the Persian king Xerxes. He wanted to expand into Europe. Greece was his gateway. Ten years earlier, his father Darius had been defeated by the Greeks at Marathon. Xerxes was determined not to suffer the same fate. He gathered a huge army from all corners of his empire as many as a quarter of a million men may have set out for Greece. Xerxes' expeditionary force to try to conquer mainland Greece was the mother of all expeditionary forces. Nothing like this had really been attempted before in the history of ancient warfare. In 480 BC, Xerxes crossed the Hellespont and moved his army down through northern Greece while the Persian fleet sailed along the coast. City after city fell. Xerxes was a pretty um, fierce sort of guy. He wouldn't stop at uh, anything to achieve his aims. But Xerxes' goal was Athens. The Greeks had to stop him at all costs, and they had to do it here at Thermopylae. Given the configuration of the Greek peninsula, that is where an army of any size has to come down. Thermopylae was the obvious place. The Greek name Thermopylae means hot gates. The place was famous for its hot springs. With high rugged mountains on one side and the waters of the Malian Gulf on the other, the narrow pass was easily defensible, but it was also the gateway to Greece. But 2,000 years of sea and wind have eroded the battle site away. This is what it looked like in 480 BC. The Greeks sent an army of 7,000 men to hold the pass. They were joined by 300 soldiers from the city of Sparta. This city-state provided a stark contrast to democratic cosmopolitan Athens. The Spartan society was at the opposite pole from Athenian society. Athenians were very open. The society was, was wide open to, to anyone who wanted to come there, and they would share everything with us, whereas the Spartans was a very closed society. Spartans were educated to be soldiers, nothing else. From the age of seven, all Spartan boys trained for war. The army was their life. Even when married, the Spartan men had to live in barracks. Sparta was a small town. It had no more than 9,000 peers, full Spartan citizens at any one time. So this army, everybody knew everybody else. If you were standing in formation, your brother might be over there, a couple of ranks behind. Your father might be over here. Your cousins would be over there. 
They provided the leadership, they provided the spearhead, they provided the backbone. They, in every respect, their presence was what made Thermopylae what it was. The 300 Spartans who marched to Thermopylae were led by Leonidas, the king of Sparta. He wasn't optimistic about his chances against Xerxes. For one thing, he had set out during the Spartan religious festival. This was thought to bring bad luck. Also, the Greeks had received bad news from the oracle here at Delphi. The priestess predicted that a Spartan king would have to die before victory was won. But Leonidas was not a man to live in fear of such an ominous prophecy. He was apparently of absolute determined resolution and personally brave. He would have been in his 50s, not a young man, coming up towards um, retiring age, even in ancient Greek terms. The Spartans wore a sculpted bronze breastplate and a helmet designed to terrify the enemy. Each man carried a shield shaped like a shallow wooden bowl. Painted on the face of the shield was the Greek letter Lambda for Lacedaemon, the Spartan homeland. The main weapon was a thrusting spear wielded over arm. Eight foot long with an ash shaft, a leaf-shaped iron head and a bronze butt spike. In close combat they drew the short sword, the Xiphos. By contrast, King Xerxes' Persian army was lightly armed. These men were trained for fast-moving warfare on open plains. Xerxes relied heavily on the Medes, who were deadly archers. But pride of place went to his household troops, the 10,000 men of the Immortals. The Immortals were the cream of the Persian army. They were recruited as an elite. The term Immortal was the Greek one, which they used because they believed that every time one of the 10,000 was killed, instantly, in reserve, there was another guy waiting just to step into his place. Leonidas stood with his Spartans at the narrowest point in the pass, with the 7,000 Greek troops deployed behind them. They defended a low wall. Meanwhile, Xerxes drew up his army on the flat ground at the entrance to the pass. Xerxes waited four days once they got into position there because he couldn't believe that these Greeks were going to actually stand and fight. He thought it was a joke. lone scout rider got sent by the Persians up to where the Spartans were waiting before the battle. And uh, some of the Spartans were out there doing their gymnastics. They were oiled up and they were combing their hair. And the rider just, looked, it just blew his mind. He said, what were these guys doing? How could they be so blasé? And of course, what they really were doing was psyching themselves up to fight to the death. On the fifth day, his patience ran out. Xerxes had a throne set up on a nearby hill. From several hundred feet above, he ordered his troops into action. From their vantage point, the Greeks could only see a few thousand. But this was merely the advance party for a force of 10,000 Medes which wound round behind the mountain. Leonidas held back his Spartans and ordered the Greek troops forward. battle of Thermopylae had begun. It would not be the walkover that Xerxes imagined. August 480 BC. The Greek army led by King Leonidas and 300 Spartans is facing a Persian army of a quarter of a million men. The Persian king, Xerxes, watched in disbelief as 5,000 Greek troops formed up in the valley entrance. They lined up in phalanx formation. The phalanx was a forest of spears. The commander would signal for the push, rear ranks pushing forward and pressing their shields 
against the backs of the men in front, and you pushed against the forces opposing you and literally tried to shove them backwards and drive them off the field. They trained their whole lives for this moment. This phalanx was 18 men deep and 64 across. Their shields overlapped like the scales on a serpent's back, virtually impenetrable. The first three ranks lowered their spears and rolled forward towards the Medes. In contrast to the Greeks, the Medes were lightly armed. They carried light wickerwork shields and spears. Before they advanced, the Mede archers fired a volley into the phalanx. Leonidas sent in more Greeks to reinforce the phalanx, pressing their weight into the backs of their fellow troops. Volley after volley of arrows filled the sky. Well, the Greek infantry had a three-foot shield. The shields were bronze-faced with maybe two inches of oak underneath that. So if you want to think of that, think of that as a kitchen cutting board. And how hard you can whack a cutting board with a battle axe and you can't break it. As the Greeks began to tire, Leonidas sent in his Spartan warriors. They advanced in a phalanx formation as the exhausted Greeks ran back. As they would advance, they would be talking to each other and inspiring each other, encouraging each other to advance while these other people are coming, advancing towards you. I mean, as each step got closer and closer, the terror must have been unbelievable. The highly trained Spartans slaughtered all in front of them. The Medes saw that their own weapons were useless and in desperation began grabbing at the Spartan spears. Now the Spartans drew the Xiphos and the real butchery began. Are you hungry? Are you tired? Are you thirsty? Are you wounded? It doesn't matter. You're a warrior and you fight. The confined space made it impossible for the Persians to take advantage of their superior numbers. They couldn't pack enough men into battle against this unrelenting killing machine. Combat in those days was, was all hand to hand. You know, nobody shot anybody, no smart bombs came in. If you were gonna kill the enemy, he was gonna be right in your face and trying to kill you. Wave after wave of Xerxes' warriors perished as they tried to penetrate the Spartan shield wall. Leonidas joked, Xerxes has plenty of men, but no soldiers. But the Greeks took casualties as well. As the battle moved into the second day, the Persians could make no headway. They were simply not prepared for this kind of fighting, far removed from the wide open plains of the east, where cavalry, chariots and light infantry could decide the outcome. Sitting on his hillside throne, Xerxes became more and more agitated, jumping to his feet every so often, like a spectator at a football match. Xerxes just said, hey, you guys go out there and take that pass, kick these guys out of the way. And these lightly armed Medes went up against the heavily armed Greeks, and the heavily armed Greeks kicked their butt. Xerxes decided to play his trump card and send in the immortals. There might have been hundreds of thousands of soldiers on the battlefield, but now the combat was between two fighting elites. 10,000 Persian immortals against what remained of 300 Spartans. August 480 BC. The Spartans had held the pass at Thermopylae for nearly a day and a half. Xerxes had failed to crack their defense. Now he sent in his own personal guard, the Immortals. They were a terrifying sight. They carried bows, spears and short daggers. But rank after rank of the elite shock troops fell in the dust. The light arm Persians couldn't penetrate the Greek armor, but the Greeks could penetrate them at will. And also the Greeks were trained 
to fight at close quarters and to come to grips at close quarters. Nothing could shake the Spartans. Xerxes needed a miracle, and it came from an unexpected source. A Greek traitor, Ephialtes, seeing a chance to get rich quick, told Xerxes about a pathway that wound over the mountainside and came out behind the Spartans. The name Ephialtes has entered the modern Greek language. It means nightmare in modern Greek. Ephialtes is today a nightmare. Under cover of darkness, the Persians filed up the track and on the morning of day three, emerged behind the Spartans. Leonidas had been outflanked. He knew this would be his last battle. To avoid unnecessary casualties, he sent most of the Greek army home. The Spartans, alongside their Theban and Thespian allies, would fight to the death. It must have been an amazingly emotional moment. As men were walking out, brave men, knowing they were going to live, while others were walking up to the front line knowing that they were going to die. One of the Greeks had warned that the Persians had so many archers that their arrows would blot out the sun. Well, said the Spartan Dionikes, we will fight in the shade. This was Spartan wit. And when somebody says something like that, you laugh and fear goes away. Leonidas was more somber. He ordered his men to breakfast, saying, tonight we shall dine in Hades. As battle recommenced, the Persians closed in from both sides on the tiny band of Greek survivors. The Spartans, with nothing to lose, fought like demons. The Persians suffered terrible losses. Then Leonidas fell. His Spartan soldiers rushed forward to save his body from capture and mutilation. The fact that the Greeks fought in the way they did to preserve his body from the Persians at the moment of final defeat again symbolizes how important the position, the, the status, the role of the king, the leader, actually was. Xerxes had tried to fight soldier to soldier in the honorable tradition of his Persian ancestors, but he couldn't break the Spartans. He had lost nearly 10,000 men, including two of his own brothers. He decided to withdraw his troops. He would finish the Spartans off at a safe distance with arrows. The Spartans regarded the bow as a weapon for cowards because it killed from a distance. Thousands of arrows rained down on the broken Spartans until not one was left standing. They were finished off by the weapons they despised most. A furious Xerxes ordered his men to find the body of Leonidas and once they'd found it, cut off his head and stick it on a pole. The Spartan king had made him pay a terrible price for victory at Thermopylae. 10,000 casualties was a drop in the bucket from such a vast force. But it was a blow to Xerxes and the morale of his army. He was astonished that men would fight for an ideal, the ideal of freedom. Xerxes raced on through Thermopylae to capture Athens, but its citizens and army had already fled. Later that same year, 480 BC, they took to ships and defeated the Persians in a great sea battle at Salamis. Xerxes' grand scheme was in ruins. Had the Spartans not done their bit at Thermopylae, then I think the whole war effort, the whole Greek resistance, would have started to crumble. For the Greeks, it was destiny. A Spartan king had died. A Persian king had been defeated, just as the Oracle of Delphi had prophesied. All kinds of great civilizations have vanished that left incredible monuments, but the Spartans left nothing. But what they left, just by their actions that one day, is more indelible and is still living today. 
For the people of Greece, the courage and heroism of Thermopylae had sent out a message of hope and pride. The 300 Spartans would never be forgotten. A grateful Greece paid the poet Simonides to compose their epitaph. Go tell the Spartans, stranger passing by, that here, obedient to their laws, we lie.